Good morning, everyone, and good evening to my friends watching in Asia. Let me once again thank my good friend, Mike Bloomberg. Mike's vision has underpinned this forum since its inception two years ago. Mike understood then that we need to bridge growing differences among nations to assure a peaceful and prosperous future. So I'm delighted to join this forum in its third year, and I'm pleased to see how it has grown and thrived. It's worth recalling that when we gathered for our first meeting, the outlines of our stormy present were already apparent. I remarked then that we'd arrived at a moment of change, challenge, and potentially even crisis. I warned that the prospect of a crisis between the United States and China was leading to the risk of an economic iron curtain. Fast forward two years. It gives me no joy to report that those warnings have been borne out. The U.S.-China relationship has become more fraught. We've seen more tariffs. We've seen heightened restrictions on the flow of technology, disruptions in supply chains, more restrictions on investment, and fewer capital flows in fewer sectors. We have fewer exchanges, and fewer students and scholars are heading in either direction. Visas have been revoked. Journalists have been expelled. Consulates have been closed. Proposed acquisitions and investments have been denied. Political rhetoric has become more inflammatory. And it has given us a taste of how debilitating strategic turbulence can be. The pandemic has made the situation worse. The U.S. and China need to work separately, jointly, and with others to end this crisis, and soon. President-elect Joe Biden has a generational opportunity to plot a course for America that allows us to compete and to thrive. I've known Joe Biden for many years. He's a unifier and a patriot. The American administration is about to change, but the clock will not simply be rewound. The Trump administration was responding to real concerns of American people about China and real failures of China to act as a responsible global citizens. The question is how we respond to these legitimate issues. One perverse benefit of the tensions that have characterized the last few years is that the dimensions of U.S.-China strategic competition have become much clearer. Even those of us who didn't agree with every policy choice in Washington or Beijing have come to understand that while new leaders can bring new policies, competition between big powers, and especially between two big powers with rival ideologies, very different political systems, is mostly structural. Competition is now baked into this relationship. A competitive approach to China was inevitable, but keeping it healthy and not pernicious is vitally important, and that won't be easy. To compete effectively, President-elect Biden will need to get the dimensions of competition with China right. So what does that mean? For many Americans, the goal of China policy has come to be one thing, achieving reciprocity. To most people, that means we will do with China only what China does with us. We will punish China when China harms us. The ongoing administration made this idea of reciprocity the very foundation of its strategy toward China. The strategy declared that the U.S. would welcome economic relationships rooted in reciprocity, implying that America would shun any and all economic relationships that lack it. This vision was welcomed by many at home and even some allies. At one level, this isn't surprising. It speaks to an American fundamental sense of fair play. It's simply unreasonable for Beijing to expect the rest of the world to keep its markets open to China unless China continues to open its markets to the world. I've long made this argument myself, but this cannot be the end of the story. Here's the big challenge. America has an open economy, which is our greatest competitive strength. 
China, by contrast, has an economy that is closed in many areas. But whenever an open economy mirrors the actions of a closed economy, the open one inevitably starts to close itself off too. If achieving reciprocity makes America's system more like China's, America will ultimately be the loser. We can't remain competitive if we become more like China with its closed status model, which I believe isn't going to stand the test of time. So it's time to adapt our principal desire for reciprocity to the evolving and real world needs of American workers, farmers, ranchers, and businesses, both small and big. It's time to move from reflexive reciprocity that responds fiercely but erratically by doing unto China what China does to us to a policy that I call targeted reciprocity. We need reciprocity targeted to changing needs of the American worker. We need reciprocity targeted to keep American businesses competitive. We need reciprocity targeted to ensure that job-creating capital continues to flow to the United States. We need reciprocity targeted to ensure that best-in-class companies want to remain headquartered in the United States. We need reciprocity targeted not at anything and everything China does. Instead, the U.S. should aim its demands for reciprocity at sectors and areas where America is the strongest and most competitive. Above all, we need reciprocity targeted so that America doesn't become less American in the bargain. We must shift from reflexive reciprocity to targeted reciprocity that holds China's feet to the fire without making it harder for Americans to thrive. Targeted reciprocity would shift our strategy from reactive to proactive. It would leverage what's best about America without losing sight of what's most competitive about America. But the path to success begins at home. And the first step is to reinvest in the policies and values that have made America thrive. Many people fret that there will be a military crisis between the United States and China, and with good reason. But this is an economic competition, not a military one. Economic power is the foundation of military power. Economic power made America the world's growth engine. And economic power enabled China to become a growth engine more recently. So if Americans want to compete with China over the long term, we must re-energize the system that has made our country the envy of the world for generations. We must prove our economic model is better than authoritarian state capitalism. Our success or failure here will be the key to American global leadership, no matter what China does. We need to look to the future and design an economic recovery program that bolsters our competitiveness. That means supporting innovation, upgrading our social safety net while maintaining incentives to work, investing strategically in infrastructure, reforming immigration policy, and importantly, addressing our structural fiscal deficit. Targeted reciprocity is the best means to execute this agenda. And that brings us back to China policy. The first priority must be rebuilding the global economy in the wake of COVID-19 and creating job opportunities for Americans while reducing economic disparity. As the two largest economies, it is in the interest of Americans, Chinese, and the world that the U.S. and China find a way to reboot global economic growth. Relentless, debilitating competition, where the two governments seek to curtail all trade, investment, and technology flows between them, will make that very difficult. Of course, investments that threaten our national security should be prohibited. But we must be careful to avoid sequestering so much technology that American companies lose their ability to commercialize and deploy their products in the world's fastest growing markets. Companies need to know where the U.S. and China are going to cooperate, 
where they are going to compete and where they are adversaries. We need major adjustments to our economic relationship with China, but we must reject the increasingly popular idea that merely having an economic relationship with China is somehow bad. What we need is one that is better suited to America's own interests. The economic linkages that are the rightful source of so much tension today do, in fact, benefit us in important ways. So here's what an agenda built on targeted reciprocity looks like. President Biden is a multilateralist. He understands we should be working with other nations to press China for structural economic changes. Biden should coordinate with leading economies to upgrade the global trading system in its governing bodies, like the WTO. Global rules for trade, investment, technology, the environment, and the digital world now lag behind reality and must be updated. If these allied economies can agree on a framework, they will be in a far stronger position to invite China to join, if it's willing to meet their agreed standards. If Beijing refuses to join this effort and remains inflexible, we should look to a punitive toolkit built on targeted reciprocity that includes jointly withholding access to our markets. Of course, that brings us to the question of bilateral tariffs, which have been the central feature of the Trump era. Tariffs are attacks on Americans. Their erratic application has harmed the U.S. reputation as a global supplier and a safe harbor for investment. Much of the damage has already been done and still our trade deficit with China continues to rise. So, so we should now link tariff removal to a new approach founded on targeted reciprocity. I would only remove existing tariffs when we have extracted a reciprocal and tangible benefit from China, met by defined benchmarks in a phased bilateral trade agreement. The Biden administration should initiate a comprehensive new round of bilateral negotiations with China. It should aim for a fair, sweeping, and reciprocal trade relationship based on more meaningful competition. Here is a nub of the strategy. Instead of President Trump's emphasis on outdated, ineffective purchase agreements, we need to focus on the future by opening key areas to investment and export. We must tackle the market distortions of China's state-owned firms, and we'll need to deal with structural and process issues that include services, not just goods. The agreement should be done in phases with regular deliverables, beginning with easier issues that build momentum to tackle the tough ones. In return, the U.S. should be prepared to open its own markets. We also need to be more consistent and predictable. Achieving this will be hard, but it will be helpful in creating jobs and assuring a more fair and equitable recovery. President-elect Biden can expand market opportunities for Americans and bolster global growth in the bargain. Another important component of a refreshed agenda is to forestall environmental catastrophe. Climate change is the most certain and formidable economic challenge the world faces. As governments develop their post-pandemic recovery strategies, promoting environmental goods and services should be a core part of fiscal stimulus plans. China took a positive step with its carbon neutrality pledge, but we should consider climate change as another economic issue that demands targeted reciprocity. For one thing, working with China is in our self-interest. If we want to prevent the worst climate outcomes and preserve essential and fragile global ecosystems, we need China to solve its massive environmental problems at home and adopt better practices abroad. America also needs to capitalize on huge economic opportunities in China and globally. That means ensuring opportunities for our businesses to invest in and export clean energy products and technologies, as well as environmental goods and services. The Biden administration plans a fresh start in climate diplomacy. 
beginning with the Paris Agreement. So we'll have a new opportunity to rethink the international climate architecture. By now, it's clear that aggressive, voluntary climate targets are insufficient. We need to create a structure with teeth, one that focuses on the major economies, including China, and deal squarely with the problem of free riding and create strong incentives to curb emissions. This should include jointly bringing clean energy technologies to the scale necessary to address climate change. We each also need to provide incentives to channel private sector capital into innovative solutions that support green development and value nature. In the same spirit, our two countries should lift tariffs on environmental goods and services. China has resisted WTO negotiations to do just that, making it difficult for U.S. firms to fully participate in an estimated $3 trillion opportunity in China to help clean up its polluted air, water, and soil. Once again, targeted reciprocity can be a negotiating tool and lever to help all of us, including Beijing, make concessions that are in the global public interest. Ladies and gentlemen, the discussion at this forum is vital. We're in the midst of a turbulent and painful period. Yet for the first time in years, we have opportunities to make a fresh start. Our first goal must be to crush the virus. Our second should be to reduce the risks, unpredictability, and volatility that have damaged our citizens' livelihoods and businesses both large and small. This is President-elect Biden's essential task. And it is our essential task. Getting strategic competition with China right will quite simply have to be part of this. Competition without unnecessary confrontation should be our goal. Because confrontation without effective competition has produced some poor results for the American people. It has damaged our economy. It has stunted our export opportunities. In time, it will threaten the peace of the world, and it does not make us safer. And so we will have chaos and conflict if we cannot get this right. This is in no one's interest. Not America's, not China's, not the world's. A clear-eyed but productive U.S.-China economic relationship built on targeted reciprocity, is what we need now for the United States to restore and strengthen its global leadership, create a safer America, and support world peace. Thank you very much.